we got a lot of good things to just share today, and I'm excited about uh, sharing this message. I'm just going to tell you that uh, it's, if you're new, I don't preach on money all the time, but this message has been coming for a while, particularly because of the testimony of one individual uh, in our church. And so I just want you to bear with me if, you, if you've come to church for the first time and you go, oh, the preacher's going to preach on money. Well, I just want to talk about really the faithfulness of God, and I think that we need that uh, in our world today. It was on the mountain of Horeb, which is uh, the far end of the desert, where he was tending to his father-in-law's flocks, and it was there that Moses had seen this flicker of light off into the crack of the crevice of the mountain there, and he went up to examine what was going on. And when he got up there, he saw an amazing thing. He saw this bush that was on fire, but as he looked at the bush, the flames were not consuming the bush. If you know this story or if you've seen the movie, you know that Moses approaches this burning bush that's not being consumed and he hears the voice of God speak to him and tell him to remove his sandals because he's on holy ground. And God interacts with Moses on that day and speaks to him and talks to him like had not really been done in such a long, long time, really, really since the time of Abraham and the patriarchs earlier. And when we read stories like that, we are amazed that that could even happen. I mean, how, how does something burn and not be consumed? And how does a voice just speak from heaven when no one's around? But when you're a Christian and you have faith, that story's not hard to believe, is it? It's not. He stood in the halls of the great Pharaoh, most likely Amenhotep II, and he commanded that he would let the people of God go. You know that Pharaoh argued with him and said he wasn't going to do that. And so Moses then turns to Aaron and he commands him to throw down the staff. And you know that his staff becomes a serpent. And you know that we learn from the Hebrew writer Janus and Jambres, the two magicians of Pharaoh's court, they throw down their staffs and they become serpents as well. But Moses' serpent eats those two serpents head and tail. And when you hear an amazing story like that, you think, wow. Can anyone believe that? And the answer is yes. When you're a Christian and you have faith, you can believe that. It's not too difficult. They had been wandering in the desert for 40 years, and now they were about ready to enter into the promised land, the land that God said He was going to give to them. But before they could do that, they had to cross over the Jordan River there. And you know that the Levites came carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and it says that when the Levite priests carrying the Ark of Covenant set their foot into the water, that the water stopped flowing, that the Jordan River uh, held back, and the nation of Israel walked across on dry ground, very much like what Moses had done when they had left Egypt. They continued to go on. They went over to the city of Jericho, the very walled, fortified city there. And you know how they marched around the city for six days. And on that seventh day, they marched around. They blew the trumpets and the walls came tumbling down. And the Israelites went in and they took the city, a city that no one thought could be taken. And when you read a story like that, you think, how in the world can some trumpets cause some walls to fall down? But when you're a person of faith, And you read a story like that, it's not hard to believe it. The great prophet Elijah was challenged 400 prophets of Baal to a contest on Mount Carmel to see which God was real. You know that after hours of chanting and shouting and dancing and cutting themselves in this frenzy, nothing happened. There was no sound. There was no movement. And so they got even more excited in their worship. And finally Elijah says, bring the water. And he has the altar drenched and he has the wood drenched there. And he prays and he calls down fire from heaven and God delivers fire and it consumes the sacrifice and the altar and the water and just eats all of that up. And there's this great revival and the prophets of Baal are put to death and God's name is elevated and vindicated there. And when we read a story like that, we think, how in the world can that happen? How can can a a, a drenched altar and drenched sacrifices with six jars, huge jars of water dumped on there three times, how can that possibly light up? But it can with the power of God. And a person of faith can believe the story because it's not that difficult. 
His body was beaten so badly that his own friends could hardly recognize him. His hands and feet were pierced with iron spikes. His body was scourged and exposing his inner flesh. And his side was pierced with a spear cutting in to the layers around his heart. He was laid in a borrowed tomb of Joseph and a huge stone was rolled over the entrance. But three days later, the stone was rolled back. And when they peered into the tomb, all they saw were empty bedclothes. And you know that the Bible continues to talk about how he was seen, how Mary saw him there, and other women saw him there, and Paul even say even 500 people saw him at one time. And we still argue and get upset over this today, and some people say there's no way that could happen. But for a person of faith, it's not hard to believe that there's a risen Savior in an empty tomb. When you hear amazing stories like this, our eyes widen, and our minds are taken to an amazing place, and we think, wow. This is the God I serve. This is the God that is revealed in this book time and time again. And we fall in love with those stories. And we love to hear those stories preached. And we love to shout to, to those stories. And we say amen to those stories because they're in the Bible. But do you believe everything that's in the Bible? I know you believe the amazing stories. But do you believe the challenging teachings? Paul writes a very challenging thing to the church at Corinth. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Remember this, he says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his own heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work as it is written he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor his righteousness endures forever now he who supplied seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of righteousness you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will reach will result rather in thanksgiving to god We don't have trouble believing the amazing passages of the Bible, but we have trouble believing the hard passages of the Bible, especially when it comes to the area of generosity and giving. I ask you, do you have the same faith for all the stories that you read in Scripture? Because I have found in my 19 years or so of preaching that people don't have the faith when it comes to their wallet. They'll trust God with their eternal life, but they won't trust God with the $3 in their pocket. How can that be? If we believe the earlier stories, then we have to believe the later stories. And some of the later stories, Jesus taught more about money and generosity and giving in the New Testament than any other single issue. And yet so often, we don't trust God in those areas. I'm here to challenge you and say today that you need to trust God in all areas. And even in the area of giving, because it is a blessing to you. It's not because God needs your money. It's because God wants an obedient servant, an obedient child of his who trusts in him, who relies on him. What I want to do today is just walk you through this little passage here and lift out three things that will help you and I think bless you as you learn to trust God, even in this area of money and giving and generosity. Let's go to God in prayer as we begin. Father God, we thank you for this day that you have given us. I thank you, Father, for the celebration, the excitement that our students have and how you've moved in their life and impacted them with the things that they have heard and shared. I pray, Father, that that fire ignites the flame that is within each one of us. And, Father, that 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 flame is fanned into a a roaring fire, Father, that just expands throughout our community and even around our world. Father, you transformed the world with 12 people, and we have 20-some young people right here. I just wonder how you can transform the world with them. Father, we're grateful for the wonderful, amazing stories of the Bible that, that we hold very dear. But Father, help us to realize that we have to be faithful even to those tough teachings, the teachings about generosity and giving that lift our eyes off of this world and into the world to come. Father, use me today just to be your servant. Father, speak your words, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
in your bulletins a little outline to kind of follow along as we walk through here. The first thing I want to help us to understand as we learn through this passage is the amount that we should give. The amount that we should give. Paul talks about this in uh, verse 7 of chapter 9. He says, each man should give what he has decided in his own heart. Almost everyone that I know believes that giving is a personal matter. They, they always just say, well, this is just between me and God. And if you don't believe me, you just ask someone if you can see their giving record at the end of the year. And they'll, they'll tell you, that, that, that's a personal issue. That, this is between me and God, and that has nothing to do with anyone else. And that might be true, but most of us take our giving so personally that we think that no one has a right to speak to us on that issue, even God himself. But the reality is, we have to ask the question, are there any biblical guidelines that help us to decide what we should give? What is a proper amount? What is a God-honoring amount? And the answer is yes. We have in the Old Testament the example of the tithe. The Jews were required to give one-tenth, one-tenth, one, one a tithe, that's what it was, of the increases of what they had that year. So when their crops produced and the fruit came on and the flocks uh, had grown and all those different things or they had, gr- had purchased land or whatever it was, that God said one-tenth of whatever the increase was was to be given to the temple for the worship of God. It was used to, to pay the priests so that they could survive because the priests, as you know, were not allotted any land when the land was divided up. And so they relied on the generosity and the obedience of the rest of the tribes of Israel. It was used to pay for the sacrifices that were burnt on a daily basis to God and the offerings that were made and the incense that was burned. It was used to pay for the upkeep of the tabernacle and later the temple. And after they had given a tenth of that, out of the remaining 90%, they gave another tenth, another tithe for special feasts for worship of the Lord, feasts such as Passover. It was sort of like having a Christmas account where you would save up some money so that you could participate in the Christmas party with the rest of the company at the end of the year. And that's kind of what they did. They would give money so that they could uh, participate and have celebratory feasts, worshiping God and honoring God on certain high days of the year. And then every third year, they gave a third tithe. And this was for the poor, for the widows, and for the inheritance of the Levites. God was providing for those who were less fortunate. The Levites, as I mentioned, had no land allotment, and so the Israelites then had to, the rest of the Israelites' tribes then had to care for them as they were allowed to live in the cities of refuge. And their whole job was to maintain the temple and to work in worship of God. In the New Testament, we have examples of giving. It's really twofold. First is that Jesus supports the act of giving a tithe. Some people say, well, that's Old Testament teaching. It is, but it's also New Testament reinforced by Jesus himself. In Matthew 23, verse 23, he said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. The Pharisees were so meticulous in the letter of the law and tithing to the the point where they even counted out every little seed of all their spices they had. And if you've ever tried to count a mustard seed or seen one, they are extremely tiny. But they would sit there and count all that stuff out, figure out how many they have, and then they would give a tenth to God. But they wouldn't love people. They would do religious things, but they didn't care about those who were hurting. They, they missed the things of the law about justice and mercy and faithfulness and love and all these things that God says, this is what the law is here, is to help us to understand and act like that. And Jesus tells them, you, you, should, have, you should have done the first, you should have done the tithing, that's a good thing, but you should not have neglected all these other things. You should have done them both. And so if someone tries to tell you that tithing is not supported in the New Testament, you just need to tell them they're wrong. Because Jesus supported it, Jesus did it. But Jesus also taught beyond the tithing in the New Testament. And that was the attitude of being generous. In Mark chapter 12, verse 41, it says that Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and he watched the crowd put their money into the temple treasury. And many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. And calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. Jesus was sitting down there, and they had like this, like a a big jar. 
And, and so when they would come in, people would drop their offering into this jar, and the Jews liked it because the money would, would clang as it would go down. And so have you ever gone to uh, a place where they, where they put the change in the, the little counter, you know, and, and you go there with your little pocket, and it goes, tink, 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 and you get like 37 cents, you know, on a little slip of paper. It would have been better off to hold on to the change. And you got someone who comes in with this big old bucket, and they're like, and things like ding, 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 ding. I mean, it sounds like Vegas hitting the jackpot, right? You know, this thing is just going crazy. And that's the way it was. And so people would come in and they would, they would drop it. Ding, 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 ding. So everyone could hear how much money they were putting into the treasury. And Jesus is just sitting there and he isn't impressed by it at all. He's just watching. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Oh, nice. Yeah, happy. But then he sees this little lady come in. Two little copper coins. Hardly worth anything. Not going to make a dent in the budget of the treasury. She puts them in and Jesus says, oh, hey, guys, come, come gather around. You see what just happened right there? And they're thinking, well, who'd we miss? Who put in? How much did they put in? What was going on? And he says, that lady right there, she gave more than anything else has been given. because She gave out of all that she had. If someone has $10 million and they put a million in the offering tray, I'll take it. <laughs> and seriously, we'll keep it. We'll do something good with it. But they got $9 million more to live on. If someone comes in and all they have is $10 to their name, that's it. And they put that $10 in the offering tray. Who's given the greater sacrifice to God? The one who said, I, I, this is all I have, but all that I have belongs to you. God is teaching us the principle of being generous. No one is asking you to give all of your money. God's not asking you to do that. He's asking you to be willing to, though. He's asking you to be willing to be generous. So when we look at the amount given, we have the principle laid down of the tithe. We still carry that over into the New Testament. And then we have the principle of not only the tithe, but learning to be generous. Not only doing what law requires, but do what love inspires. Do what love inspires. The second thing that we learn about this is the attitude that we should have. In verse 7, it says this, Give not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Giving is an act of worship to God as much as anything else we do on Sunday. I hate sometimes how we have used the word worship because we have used the word worship in a way that it only describes singing. We say, well, we had a wonderful worship time. And most of the time people think it's all about the songs. And there is a time of celebration and, and, and a time for rejoicing and a time for music and giving praise to God. But we will also worship in a moment when we will gather around these tables and when we will take the emblems here and remember that Jesus died for us. And remember that there was bloodshed on the cross of Calvary that washes our sins away, that gives us entrance into heaven. And we will worship through time of prayer. And we will worship through hearing the word of God. And we will worship by just being silent before the Lord. See, everything that we do is worship. Worship is giving worth to God. It's not one aspect of it. And part of worship is giving back to God and recognizing that God has blessed me this week. That God has been faithful in giving to me. And he's wanting to see and he's waiting to see, will I be faithful back to him? And will I be generous back to his cause? Giving is as much an act of worship as anything else that we do. And our giving should be motivated out of love, not law. The law gives us a baseline, but love challenges us to do so much more. I mean, think about this. You can be married by law but not have love in a marriage, right? And we see this all the time. We go, well, they're married. Really? They don't hold hands. They don't hug. They don't kiss. They don't do anything. Nothing that a loving couple would do, but they have a piece of paper that says they're husband and wife. Well, there's some people, I think, who are kind of like that with God. They're legally bound to God, but there's no love in the relationship between them and God. God doesn't want you to do things out of compulsion. God doesn't want you to do things out of being forced into it. He doesn't want you to do it out of uh, being reluctant. He wants you to give out of cheerfulness. And we understand and we see this the most at Christmas time. I wish we could see it all year round. But at Christmas time, everyone gets jolly, right? And everyone's willing to give. And, and we like to give presents to one another. And we like to in invite people over. And we like to be hospitable. And we like to just be a little bit of Jesus for a few weeks out of the year. Well, we should have that attitude all the time. I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things I love to do is to give things to people. I, I, I just I like how it makes me feel. And I think it's because when I do that, it makes me more like God than probably about anything else I do 
other than maybe forgiving one another. Because when you read in the Bible, even in John 3.16, before it talks about Jesus, it says that God loved the world that he what? That he gave. And he gave generously because he gave his son. And when you give generously, you reflect your father in heaven. But when you're stingy, when you're selfish, when you're inward thinking, you don't reflect God. You reflect somebody else. Let's look at this third thing here, and that is that we learn the achievement of our experience. Look what Paul says here in verse 8 and following. He says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, He has scattered abroad His gifts to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Now He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your storehouse of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. When we look at this passage, and this is a challenging part here, God will provide for your needs. When I got out of the military, when I got out of the Marine Corps, and I, I went back to school and, and went back to work, for the first three years, my salary just kept going down. And you've got to start thinking, you're not making good, you know, good job moves when every year you're, you're making less and less. But in that time, God provided for our needs. I, I was never hungry, as you can clearly see. <laughs> I did not go naked. I was not out in the streets. I didn't live as you know, some hobo under the bridge. God provided for my needs. I can tell you, he did not provide for my wants. Sometimes God gives us our wants. Sometimes he's a good God and he wants to give us things. And there's sometimes he withholds things because he knows it's not good for us. He doesn't always give us what we want because sometimes the things we want are not the things that are best for us. And God knows that. Parents know that, right? The kid wants chocolate. He wants chocolate 24-7. All they want to do is eat chocolate from the moment they get up to the moment they go to bed. Now, as a parent, is chocolate good for your kids 24-7? <laughs> Some of you parents have issues with chocolate because you're like, oh, preacher, yes, it is. It's a food group. No, it's not, you know. You know, bacon is a food group, but, okay. <laughs> Bacon-covered chocolate is probably a food group. <laughs> well, we understand that just giving them tons of sugar and giving them all these things, that's not what they need. They need health. They, they need vegetables. They need protein. They need other different things, and God understands that, and God says, I will provide for your needs, and I can tell you that God has provided for my needs, I'm a little upset at times when he doesn't provide for my wants because I'm a spoiled little child, and so are you. But God has provided for our needs, and he will provide for your needs. And God will bless you so that you will be able to be even more generous. I heard a preacher say, I think it was Tony Evans as he was preaching, I can't remember now, but he said, God will not give you more until he can get more through you. Some of us are saying, God, give me more. And we're saying, give me more so that we can have more, so we can hold on to more. And God's saying, why would I give you more just so you can hold on to it when I can give it to someone else who's generous to let that go out and let my name be praised? See, we need to learn to be generous so that we can be like God. And I think that when we are, God's going to allow things to flow through us so that we can continue to be generous. I believe that because that's what the scripture says. If I believe those stories of Moses, then I have to believe this too. We invest and those things that give us a good return. And God just might be looking at you saying, you're not a really good investment for my kingdom right now. You're like AIG, man. Everything goes into you and it just goes away. For some of you, God knows that there's some potential. And let me just tell you, God's ready to invest in you. But he wants you to be a good steward of that. The third thing is this, God will be glorified in our obedience and generous giving. When you give, you have an opportunity to speak into someone's life that may not ever be there until a wall comes down where they go, someone loves me, someone cares about me. When you give of your time, when you give of a hug, when you give of all those different things, walls come down. And we know that walls come down in relational ways and that way, but walls will come down when we give when someone is in need and you say, you know what, I, I just, I just want to help you out. When I was out of work for about four months at the church before I came here, Garnita, who has now gone on to be with the Lord, she had 
um, her and Jimmy were an older couple, and they became like grandparents to us when we were there. And uh, Jimmy had passed away of cancer, and, and he had all these old cars. They had no children. And he had all these old cars. So Jimmy and I naturally clicked together because he liked cars, I liked cars, and I'd go over to his house, spend a lot of time with him. Well, they, they auctioned all that off, put all that money into um, uh, an account, and they were giving out scholarships and stuff like that. And, and so we were out of work. I had enough money to live for three months. I had saved up enough to live for three months. And every once in a while, we would come into church, and Garnita would just give me an envelope, and, and usually there was several hundred dollars in there, four or five hundred dollars at a time. And it would just say, just because it's Tuesday, <laughs> the card, just because it's Tuesday, here you go. It was really hard for me to accept that kind of stuff, because I was the kind of person that always say, oh, no, 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 I don't want to. And I realized by doing that, I was denying her a blessing, and so I learned to just say, thank you. But in doing that, I got to see Jesus in a powerful way in her life. To her, it was just money. But to me, it allowed me to feed my kids. It allowed me to clothe my kids. It allowed me to keep the power on and just to keep going on. And God provided for my needs through her. And in the meantime, he was receiving the glory. I just wonder what kind of glory you're giving to God in your giving. When we're generous with our possessions, God is exalted. I, I was just thinking about that last night. So, and, some of you have done far more than me, so don't, don't get me wrong when I tell this story. But I was thinking about all the cars that I have given away to the teens that I've known at, at different uh, churches that we've been in. I was counting them up. I think I've given six cars away to teenagers. I'm all out of cars, guys. I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> but I think about the ability that God gave me when I was able to give a car away. I was able to also purchase a car that provided for me. And then give another car away and purchase a car. I think that God used those experiences to just teach in the life of those young people that there are people who are generous that give you a, a helping hand to step up. And I would just challenge you to be generous. My point of all this this morning is to simply to say one few things. I'm going to ask Paul if you'll come up here. That as Christians, that we can believe those amazing stories of the Bible. But we need also to believe these tough teachings here. And I know that you expect me as a preacher to tell you I tithe and I give and, and God has blessed me and God has taken care of me. You expect your preacher to say that. But it's true in my life. But I want you to hear some man's testimony today that's in our church. And a while ago, uh, probably earlier in the year, maybe November sometime, I can't remember when I preached this series of sermon on finances, I made this challenge. I've never done this before, ever. And I said, you track what you give for the next three months. You tithe to God. You honor God. And you track it. We'll track it. You put your name on it. We'll track it. If God doesn't provide for your needs at the end of those three months, we'll write you a check. We'll give you all your money back. <laughs> the elders didn't know I said I was going to do that. They were like, what? Uh, this is what we're doing. All right. Paul here is going to tell you how he thought, man, this is a sure winner. I'm getting all my money back. Paul, why don't you come tell your story here? Let me get you a, a mic. Hold it close, and they'll be able to hear you. <laughs> All right. Well, he forgot out. He forgot one little thing he mentioned before that. He, there was two things that shocked me. I never heard a preacher say, and the first one was test God. I said, "What? I'm not going to test God." He said, "It's a test. You, you trust Him in everything else. You test Him with everything else. Test Him with your money." Then a few minutes later, he did say that he would give me all my money back in three months if I fell short. I said, "I'm going to do that." I'll soon be 55, and when I went to church, I always just give after I paid my rent or mortgage or food. I had all of that, and whatever I had left over is what I gave. Not totally, you know, I just thought giving a little bit here and there was the tithing. But no, I took the tenth of the very top of what we had for the last three months, and every week that's what I gave. Then after that, that's what I lived on. So I thought, okay, I'm going to test God. So I'm a school bus driver for a charter school in Cape Coral and, and for 25 hours. And then for 15 hours, to make my 40 hours, I'm their maintenance person. So here it is Christmas time. Two weeks, all the kids are out of school. I'm doing bus stuff. I'm doing maintenance. And that Monday, the kids come back, teachers come back. A couple of teachers didn't come back. And it's a charter school. It's all about the money. And uh, the 
principal comes to me and says, we're only going to be able to pay you for one week, even though you work two. I said, hmm. It's too important. They got to hear you. All right. <laughs> and I said, ooh. And then I said, really, Jesus? This is, what I, this is what I'm saying. Really, Jesus? You know I'm giving you a tenth of everything I have, and now I'm not going to get paid, and you know I'm going to quit because I'm not going to be accept this. So sure enough, after I took the kids home that day, I told them, you know, if you're not going to pay me for my two weeks, then I'm just going to find something else. And God provided. The next day I had a job. I was driving a truck, not a school bus, not being around the kids, not loving what I really wanted to do. But I had a job the next day. But it took a week to go through the paperwork, DOT, all this stuff. So here I am telling my wife. And, she, and my wife's German, but she is to the penny. Let me tell you when it comes to money. Bills come first, we come second. So she goes, we're going to be really short on food. And I said, well, she goes, first she goes, well, we'll just make it up. We'll pay later the 10th. I said, no, we're going to pay the church. We're going to do what we said we're going to do. So that Friday, she goes to the mailbox, and she pulls out this envelope. And I open it, and there was a check in there for the exact same dollar amount that we give for tithe. You know what it was from? A year ago when I hurt my finger at a job, and they said, we forgot to pay you this amount. A year ago. And I get it that week. So, here I'm at my new job, driving a truck, and it's an old truck. And it kept having problems, kept having problems. And I made my 90 days, so they didn't fire me. And the truck had problems, and the guy goes, you know, you're just not getting it. I think I'm going to have to let you go. And I said, really, Jesus? Really? And I knew that things were not looking good, so I'd already started looking for another job. And the day that... My truck went out again. I said, he's not going to believe it. He's going to think it was me. I said, so I just took the truck back to the shop, didn't say nothing, got in my car and left. Then he calls me. He goes, what's going on? I said, well, you're not going to believe me. You think that I broke the truck, so I know you're going to fire me. So I took the truck back to the company, got in my car and left. He goes, you're right. You're fired. So the next day I had a job doing the same stuff for a different company. But it took a week. And I said, and I forgot to tell you. The guy took $340 out of my paycheck to fix his truck. I know I could have sued him and all this stuff, but I'm not that kind of person. So I had a job. I had, still was behind a week plus the money. And you're not going to believe it. When she went to the mail, checked the mail, there was another check in there for the exact same. And you know what it was from? Escrow. They said, oh, you paid too much in your escrow this year. Here's a check. You know, that's when it really hit me, folks. That's when it really hit me. I did, this is not coincidence. This is Jesus. Remember when I told you I was testing Jesus? No, he was testing me. My faith. How I was going to uh, handle not having enough. But he already knew my future. He already knows where I needed to go. Yes, I'm not around kids. I'm not on a school bus. But he provides for me from this job. More than I ever thought of. Now I can give my 10% and I don't have that, that hole in my heart, that anxiety. I'm not looking for other jobs. And I've always done that. I always want to make that extra dollar or get better benefits. It's all gone. I don't do that no more. I'm happy with where I'm at. I'm happy with what I make. And I'm content. If I want something, I'll save up for it. I'm just content. And that's what Jesus' whole point, I believe, was really telling me to be content with what I had. The church is our body. We need to give. I always thought it was about the numbers. The numbers. Mm, I'm getting dry. Anyway, it's not. It's not how big the church is. It's how spiritually we've become and, and can become. We need to have faith. We need to trust Jesus with everything. Because like Steve was saying, we trust him with everything else. But this time I trust him with my money. And he has really opened my eyes and my heart with everything that I do. Thank you. You know, I know that story can be repeated probably a dozen times over in this church. And where people said, you know, God, I just don't know if I can believe in you. I just want to tell you, you can, you can trust God. 
you can trust God. We're getting ready to come to a, a time of invitation, or invitation, to come to the table here. And I purposely wanted Paul to speak before we did this because as we come to worship and take of the communion, we also have a chance to give. And I would just challenge you to do what Paul says. Each man should decide in his heart what he should give. Give cheerfully. Give of a heart that says, I honor you, God, because you've given to me. And as you come around the table of the Lord, you're reminded what Jesus gave for you. He gave his life. And so we can't buy that. And our money's not going to pay for our salvation. It's a free gift that God has given us. So we take it. We say thank you. We live as righteously as we can. And we say, God, when I am blessed by you, I'll honor you. Let's pray.